all for coming. I, I very much appreciate you being here. And my title of tonight's talk is How Literature Redeems the Mundane, The Depth, Purpose, and Thrill of Monotony. But as I started writing it, I realized I really should have called this talk, I should have titled it The Cultivation of Wonder. So my goal is to encourage us to experience both the reading and the study of literature as an act of wonder. Not simply as a means of gaining knowledge or producing a product, not simply as a means to an end. Too often we, and I include myself, <laughs> approach literature as a scientist at a microscope. It is a task to do. We must sit down seriously. We turn off the overhead lights, we switch on our microscope's light, we scoot up close, we press our eyes against the instrument, and we start squinting at the text. And how many times, especially those of you who have been my students, have I said, we must examine the literary elements. And breaking down this passage, and in our close reading analysis, <laughs> so can I fault any of us, um, any of my students, for propping open glazed eyes and letting tired sighs escape as they once more, very dutifully, examine these isolated pieces <laughs> of a paragraph or sentences set before them? Where is the thrill, though, the excitement, and the wonder in studying literature in this way? Monotony can soon set in. We will turn and watch the clock. We will turn, if we're listening to a book, set, speed up the playback speed. If we do the same exercise over and over again, all too often, the repetition might lead to being tedious, dull, and seeing something now as a whole work of art becomes just pieces. Maybe even pieces of a puzzle, and we don't even care what the picture is, or we don't know what the picture is. So to use another analogy, experiencing literature in this way is as if we are at the dinner table and it is dessert time and we are presented with an eye-catchingly delicious cake. Perhaps a carrot cake, cream cheese frosting, or German chocolate cake with raspberries on top. So I ask you all to imagine your favorite cake in front of you and you're watching as the server slices through oh so smoothly and a lovely triangular piece is set right before you and you scoop up a piece in your fork and you pop it in your mouth and instead of saying, mmm, so good, you're like, I taste three cups of white granulated sugar <laughs> and I have two, no, three tablespoons of butter, unsalted. And all of a sudden now you're, you're talking about the um, almond flour versus the white flour versus Madagascar vanilla extra, and now it's become pieces, and you're missing the joy and the wonder of the whole. So if we read a book as a task, to name and to analyze symbols, themes, and motifs, we are, we might be settling for a mundane experience, when it could be very thrilling. Now, especially as a professor of literature, I do not want to discard close reading analysis. And I do not want to devalue knowing the names of our literary devices, of examining those symbols, themes, and motifs. They are all very good and necessary to both the study and the appreciation of literature. And if you guys are bakers, professional, or just every old, every, any day old cook, then yes, you do want to know your food, measure up the portions, get the right ingredients, make sure you pour in just the right amount of vanilla, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> so I'm not, I do not want to say that analysis equals bad, seeing the whole equals good, because we know, of course, that you need both. We know that analyzing the parts needs to be ordered and balanced to reach a greater understanding of the whole quote to myself <laughs> in class, we want to see the old anew. So we should not shun that more technical side of understanding literature. In fact, it's actually quite awesome to find a common ground between the sciences and humanities, since we often hear them contrasted as insurmountable gulfs. I'm a math person, I'm a literature person, but for me, Gosh, it'd be so much easier to write a poem than to try to figure out how much I need to tip on this meal, but <laughs> it's okay. And it's realizing that we're actually, no matter our field, we're approaching our study in a similar manner. We make observations. We ask questions. 
We form a hypothesis or an interpretation. We test it. We find evidence. We reach a conclusion. So even though our content is different, we are speaking the same language of symbols and induction. So, so just please don't walk away from this talk thinking, talk thinking, Dr. Sol, you told us literary analysis is mundane and pointless. <laughs> or like, now you're going to switch your major from literature to math. I mean, you could, or you could double major. But basically, what I want to emphasize is that this technical knowledge of literature and writing is very important. It's necessary. But if we only see that technical side, and we only see the pieces and learn the names, um, and we forget this necessary, very necessary, first, middle, even last step of wonder, then reading literature, studying it, will, might become monotonous and mundane. If all we're doing is reading in order to analyze, learning terms in order to define them, writing essays in order to get a grade, and then we move on, we've forgotten the ultimate goal, which I would um, argue is wonder. So now I ask, in a very scientific manner, what is wonder? <laughs> How do we define it? What is the nature of it? And what attitudes can help us cultivate this wonder? Also, where does it lead us? I will use examples from literature to respond to these questions, um, but I will also answer the last question first. <laughs> so I believe you already know this. To paraphrase Socrates, wonder is the beginning of wisdom. I believe the actual quote wonders the feeling of a philosopher and philosophy begins in wisdom. And Einstein even characterized this experience of the mysterious as, quote, a fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and science. He who can no longer wonder is as good as dead, a snuffed out candle. Pretty powerful, pretty powerful. Wonder, though, which is key, it has to lead us somewhere, or perhaps to someone. Or we will be, as Pope St. Gregory the Great said, we will be like the foolish traveler who is so distracted by the pleasant meadows through which he is passing that he forgets where he is going. So how do we remember where we are going? How can wonder about or wonder in literature redeem the mundane? So first, to go back to my questions, what is wonder? The dictionary defines it. <laughs> the dictionary defines it as a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration, caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. It's a noun, named for something that persons that we experience, yet it's also a verb. As a verb, this after state of being, wonder is a desire, it's a curiosity, or even doubt about something which surprises you, and that something mysterious or amazing, something inexplicable. So it can be this motion. And remember too, wonder is this beginning step, but it's also ongoing, and it's instigated by something both known and unknown. So let's turn to literature. Willa Cather, My Antonia, was published in 1918. As I read, listen to this passage and think about the narrator's wonder. To give the context of the passage, Jim Burden, he's the narrator, he, in My Antonia, tells of his childhood, living with his grandparents on a farm in Nebraska, and of his friendship with an immigrant girl, Antonia, from Bohemia, part of the Czech Republic. The story is of their adventures, both comic and tragic, of growing close and growing apart. Now, this passage comes near the end. I'm sorry for spoiler alert, but knowing this will not lessen your enjoyment of the book if you have not read it. And I do recommend that you do read the book and we read it. Uh, but Jim is now grown up. He's gone off to university. He's traveled far from Nebraska. And all the while, Antonia has stayed. She stayed back. So Jim is returning years later to visit her, and Antonia is now married, she has 10 children, and she's living a farmer's life in a small house, it's almost described as cave-like, cave -like, and it's a tough life. She's been roughened by the toil and the years. And after visiting, Jim walks away and he reflects. I lay awake 
prayed for a long while until the slow moving moon passed my window on its way up the heavens. I was thinking about Antonia and her children, about Anna's solicitude for her, Ambrose's grave affection, Leo's jealous animal little love. That moment when they all came tumbling out of the cave into the light was a sight any man might have come far to see. Antonia had always been one to leave images in the mind that did not fade, that grew stronger with time. In my memory, there was a succession of such pictures, fixed there like the old woodcuts of one's first primer. Antonia kicking her bare legs against the sides of my pony when we came home in triumph after our battle with the snake. Antonia in her black shawl and fur cap as she stood by her father's grave in the snowstorm. Antonia coming in with her work team along the evening skyline. She lent herself to immemorial human attitudes, which we recognize by instinct as universal and true. I had not been mistaken. She was a battered woman now, not a lovely girl. But she still had that something which fires the imagination, could still stop one's breath for a moment by a look or a gesture that somehow revealed the meaning in common things. She had only to stand in the orchard, to put her hand on a little crab tree and look up at the apples to make you feel the goodness of planting and tending and harvesting at last. All the strong things of her heart came out in her body that had been so tireless in serving generous emotions. It was no wonder that her sons stood tall and straight. She was a rich mine of life. My Antonia, so strong, so beautiful, evoking so much wonder. Now Jim has been fascinated his whole life by her spirit and her life. All he was a boy, still is as a man. He knows her, he knows Antonia, he's known her for decades now, and yet there's still something surprisingly unknowable about her. We hear his admiration, his intrigue of the mystery. What makes Antonia the strong, generous, rich mine of life? That is the wonder. And a very key part, the wonder does not cloud reality. Jim does not soften his description of Antonia with rose-colored glasses. She is tired. She is worn and battered. A farming life in the late 1800s of a still wild Western America is no easy life. Jim sees her truly and wholly, and Antonia shows the effects of her struggles and her sufferings. Yet, beauty is still there. Wonder is a feeling, an emotion that clarifies our vision, awakens us intellectually, emotionally, imaginatively, and excites us to return to the rich mind for more refreshment and life. It brings joy, it refreshes, and causes us to return to encounter it again. In fact, Jim makes plans to return to Antonia's family to take her boys hunting. Then wonder renews him. He sees her for who she is. He knows her but does not know all. Her life still contains an enchantment for him, one that takes him outside of himself to marvel at the mysteries of life overall. What is wonder then, not just defined by the dictionary? It's that experience we have of being moved by something to draw closer, to learn more, to ponder its mysteries, and also then to reflect on our own lives and relations to others and to the world. So for another example, here's a poem by Mary Oliver. She wrote this in 1992. And as I read it, know how she starts with the big questions. The very big question, who made the world? She starts with the big question and a wide lens scope that then becomes focused on a particular. And wonder about that particular leads her back through seeing uh, through a, a wide lens again. So this is Mary Oliver's poem, and it's called The Summer's Day. Who made the world? Who made the
the swan and the black bear. Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I don't know how to pay attention, how to fall down. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Now we could immediately begin to analyze this poem. <laughs> no, her use of anaphora, alliteration, assonance, consonance, and depiction of concrete imagery, all of which are good to know and to note, but let's not do that for now. Let's instead model Mary Oliver in her poem and keep questioning. We'll question what wonder is and how it helps us to plan or to find the purpose of our one wild and precious life. So what is the nature of wonder? And what attitudes should we have to cultivate wonder? In an article just written last year by Father Brian O'Leary, an Irish priest, he said, in his article entitled, Through Wonder to Fruitfulness, he wrote, quote, wonder and amazement come easily to young children. Everything is being seen, heard, touched, tasted, smelled for the first time. Theirs is a world of the senses and the feeling. It is a world of immediacy. A child does not have to be taught how to wonder. Every sensation, every experience is novel, fresh, exciting. It cannot be otherwise. This is the nature of childhood. Adults, on the other hand, are more likely to be conscious of the repetitiveness of life, the monotony of experience. This can be accompanied by a sense of heaviness, sometimes of dreariness or boredom. It can even reach the level of disenchantment or disillusionment. Even when something apparently new happens, the adult response is frequently muted. Mild surprise, perhaps, rather than exhilaration. A raised eyebrow, rather than an exuberant dance. End quote. So how do we move from a raised eyebrow to an exuberant dance? I will offer three attitudes to cultivate this wonder. And these are garnered from the ideas that stem from uh, this article that I read, also from Dana Joya in his talk, um, Catholic Imagination and Contemporary Culture, also from Roger Scruton in his talk, What is Beauty, and Ryan Wilson's article, How to Think Like a Poet. So the first. To cultivate wonder is to have a spirit of openness and respect to that which you encounter. Now this is coming from Ryan Wilson's uh, How to Think Like a Poet. And he suggests that we welcome the new idea like Zinnia. This requires a willingness to suspend judgment. To practice Zinnia is to welcome the stranger as a guest that must be treated well, protected, fed, given gifts. So the stranger could be a book, a painting, a piece of music, a new idea, or even an old idea come to visit you once more. Could be Antonia, a small little immigrant girl who just moved into the neighboring farm. Or it could be a grasshopper that hopped into your hand as you were lying in the field. So to practice this openness, this respect, this zania, let that character or let that song approach you, live with you, and share its life with you. Listen to its stories, observe it, suspend your judgment for a time. Obviously, there are caveats and dangers to this kind of openness and vulnerability. For such a visitor that you hospitably welcome to your Spartan palace could steal your wife, the most beautiful woman in the world, and escape across the Aegean Sea and instigate a 10-year-long war of gods and heroes. But also, 
If that openness, that suspension of judgment, that vulnerability is absent, your wonder may be snuffed out. Approaching books or classes we take or people we meet with this attitude of zania could lead us to change our minds for good or for the not good. So still with respect to the stranger that we welcome, we also need a healthy certitude that we won't be destroyed by that guest. Thank goodness then for our Catholic liberal arts education where the wonder and the openness to different ideas are welcomed hospitably all the while remaining faithful to our tradition and our beliefs. So first, to cultivate wonder, practice mania while walking strong on your foundation of faith. Second, the openness, this mode of zania, this, this respect towards the strange, the stranger, it requires an awareness of time. The experience of wonder engages our emotions as well as our intellect. My poetry students will well know this list that good poetry should engage your reason, your emotion, your imagination, and your senses. Great poetry can physically make you feel something. Marianne Moore, in her poem entitled Poetry, <laughs> claimed that poetry is, quote, a place for the genuine, where your hands can clasp, your eyes dilate, your hair rise. She says, great writing, great poetry can let you walk in, quote, imaginary gardens with real toads in them. When you are caught by wonder while reading a paragraph or a poem or even a sentence, then you must recognize you've been caught. Stop the progress. Go back, reread the passage again and again. Let yourself be moved by that feeling. But again, a caveat, don't be too moved. <laughs> Roger Scruton advocates having a, quote, disinterested interest in approaching art. We should be engaged, but also disengaged. Attached, but also detached. Interested, but also disinterested. Easy peasy. <laughs> what helps, though, is time and awareness of that time. We need to be aware that this is a moment that caught my attention for a reason. Thus, we are aware that we are stopping to ponder. We are engaged, but we are also disengaged. Dana Joya reminds us that beauty has a, quote, arresting power. We don't know why we stopped, but something caught us and made us feel or think something, and we want to follow up on that encounter. This is the challenge of wonder and why wonder often gets derailed and we enter monotony again, is that it requires time. And who has the time? How do we fit in class and mass and practice and games and setting up for the event and going to the event and cleaning up after the event and studying and reading and eating and sleeping and talking and listening and walking and writing and wonder? <laughs> easy peasy, very easy. Um, but this awareness of being in a state of wonder helps us. We are stopped by something and we recognize that we are stopped. We let the experience sink in. And even though we have to move on, and we must move on, that awareness slow time down for a moment. And in so doing, restored and renewed something within us. It allowed us to feel and recognize that fire of inspiration, to become uplifted by this admiration, um, it allows us to acknowledge the thirst for knowing something more. So our time, given to wonder, and the awareness of that time leads us to our third attitude, to redeem the mundane and the monotonous of studying literature or reading approaching literature. That attitude is gratitude. <laughs> when we encounter that which is beautiful, mysterious, curious, amazing, wonderful, full of wonder, should elicit a great awareness of ourselves as individuals, unique thinking, breathing, living human beings, but connected to others and the world and hopefully to God. When we give thanks for that moment of wonder to the artist, to the author, to the songwriter, to the movie director, the actor, the geometrician, I found Euclid really beautiful, <laughs> and of course to God, we, come, we become aware of our humanity and I would argue our divinity. We recognize we're not alone, that we were brought to this particular time and place, and we're given a gift to recognize we're meant for more than just getting to the next task. 
We are meant for a higher level of active contemplation, heart and mind, soul and body. We are led to ponder and pursue our purpose of our own, of our one wild and precious life with greater zeal. So to step back and give a literary example of these three attitudes, the openness of Zania, the awareness of time, the gratitude, to experience this wonder, let's go back to childhood at home with Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows, published in 1908. I'm going to read the opening paragraph, and I want you to note the busyness of mole. Perhaps we could, kind, we could call this kind of work mundane and monotonous. We always have to clean. <laughs> it's a never-ending task, and it takes a lot of effort, but it's good, and it's necessary. But know how mole feels this tug, but he keeps spring cleaning. And then the tug becomes so strong that he can't ignore it. He stops. He makes time. He's aware of this. And he sees this, yes, maybe as interruptive, but a welcome guest. And he makes himself vulnerable by rising to the surface of the earth and gratefully encounters the wonder of spring. So from the wind in the willows. The mole had been working very hard all morning, spring cleaning his little home. First with brooms, then with dusters then on ladders and steps and chairs with a brush and a pail of whitewash till he had dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below and around him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was small wonder then that he suddenly flung his brush on the floor and said, bother and oh, blow and also hang spring cleaning, and bolted out of his house without even waiting to put on his coat. Something up above was calling him imperiously. And he made for the steep little tunnel, which answered, in his case, to the graveled carriage drive owned by animals, whose residences are nearer to the sun and air. So he scraped and scratched and scrubbed and scrooged, and then he scrooged again and scrabbled and scratched and scraped, working busily with his little paws and muttering to himself, up we go, up we go, till at last, pop, his snout came out in the sunlight, and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. This is fine, he said to himself. This is better than whitewashing. The sunshine struck hot on his fur, soft breezes caressed his heated brow, and after the seclusion of the cellarage he had lived in so long, the carol of happy birds fell on his dulled hearing almost like a shout. Jumping off all his four legs at once in the joy of living and the delight of spring without its cleaning, he pursued his way across the meadow till he reached the hedge on the further side. Good job, Mole. <laughs> Enjoy that spring moment. And I know you have to get back to work. Um, don't get in a motor car with Toad. <laughs> um, but also, so now, to conclude with our last question, where does this wonder lead us? Well, interestingly, it is something individual. It will take each of us to discover our own individual purpose. Obviously, and hopefully, it'll ultimately lead to a greater love and knowledge of God, of self, and neighbor. But in general, this wonder should lead us somewhere deeper. Deeper in our awareness of ourself and purpose, and that discovery should refresh, restore, and even excite us. To return to the subtitle of my talk, The Depth, Purpose, and Thrill of Monotony, I'll offer a final literary example and reflection on how this cultivation of wonder can happen every day, can redeem those mundane tasks we must do over and over again, and can turn, can turn these repetitive acts into joyful ones. How so? Let's look at Lily Bart, the heroine of Edith Wharton's novel, The House of Mirth, which was published in 1918. Lily is a beautiful woman, Still unmarried, although approaching the ripe old age of 30, the end of youth and beauty for her early 1900s New York wealthy socialite society. And one mistake after another leaves her almost in despair that she is of any worth at all. She feels like a dusty ornament on a shelf, off to the side, 
She was at one time, and for a long time, the beautiful ornament that was admired and placed in the center of attention. But now she's forgotten, broken, and senses she might be thrown away soon. And so in this state of mind, she happens upon an old schoolmate of hers, Mrs. Struther, a nice ordinary girl without the arresting beauty of Lily. And Mrs. Struther, Nettie, has a new baby. Nettie has suffered as well and tells Lily of the unexpected joy of her marriage and what baby, the joy of her marriage and baby had given to her. And as I read this passage, note how Lily responds when Nettie places her child into Lily's arms. So Nettie is chattering as she feeds her baby from the milk bottle. And if George cared for me enough to have me as I was, I didn't see why I shouldn't begin over again. And I did. The strength of the victory shone forth from her as she lifted her irradiated face from the child on her knees. But mercy, I didn't mean to go on like this about myself with you sitting there looking so tired. Only it's so lovely having you here and letting you see just how you've helped me. The baby had sunk back blissfully replete, and Mrs. Struther softly rose to lay the bottle aside. Then she paused before Miss Bart. I only wish I could help you. But I suppose there's not on earth I could do, she murmured wistfully. Lily, instead of answering, rose with a smile and held out her arms. And the mother, understanding the gesture, laid her child in them. The baby, feeling herself detached from her habitual anchorage, made an instinctive motion of resistance. But the soothing influences of digestion prevailed, and Lily felt the soft weight sink trustfully against her breast. The child's confidence in its safety thrilled her with a sense of warmth and returning to life. And Lily bent over, wondering at the rosy blur of the little face, the empty clearness of the eyes, the vague, tenderly motions of the folding and unfolding fingers. At first, the burden in her arms seemed as light as a pink cloud or a heap of down. But as she continued to hold it, the weight increased, sinking deeper and penetrating her with a strange sense of weakness, as though the child had entered into her and became a part of herself. Lily clasped the child close for a moment and then laid her back into her mother's arms. This is a beautiful and sorrowful scene at the same time. Lily feels the weight of the baby. There's a depth and a substance in this moment of wonder. She looks at the little face, the eyes, the folding and unfolding fingers, and she experiences an awakening of her own life and a joy at seeing the life of this child. And yet she knows it is temporary. She must give the child back. There comes a time when even mothers can no longer pick up and cradle their own children. But that moment of wonder and weight and substance was key for Liddy, Lily. It woke her up and renewed and refreshed her. It allowed her to sense that fire of life within her own self. To quote Brides had revisited, she might even have felt that small red flame burning within. She was at first hesitant and unaware of what was happening, but she, even in that short time, was aware something deep within her was refocusing her sight on what truly is important in life. And that is the goal, this deep down experience of awareness of our individual self, yet intimately connected with the rest of humanity and hopefully leads to this intimacy and union with God. It is a hopeful and thrilling moment to wonder and discover and to ponder mysteries that deepen our awareness of our purpose in life. Gerard Manley Hopkins speaks of this depth and purpose in his sonnet, God's Grandeur. He writes how despite man's smearing and blearing of the world with toil and trade, the grandeur of God shines forth like shook foil and there is a dearest freshness of deep down Here's his poem, God's Grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. 
It will flame out like the shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went on morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. So this experience of wonder is a tangible feeling in which our bodily senses and our reason and our emotion are all working together. Reading and studying literature with this sense of wonder, with the openness, this zinnia, suspension of judgment, with a recognition and awareness of time, and with gratitude, will restore us from seeing that which, that which we must do over and over again, the literary analysis, the essay writing, the naming of poetic devices, will prevent us from seeing them as repetition and monotonous. It is far from it. Instead, each step in gaining knowledge is another step in being more susceptible to that experience of wonder. Wonder is the beginning of wisdom, but we constantly need to be ready and open to the wonder to continue walking the path towards wisdom. So I will close now with the words of Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen, have his book right here. Life is worth living. And it is signed by Fulton Sheen himself. It says to Lou and Bess Marvin, God love you with the cross, Fulton Sheen. And I found this in a thrift store for 50 cents. <laughs> Holding on to it. So here we go. Um, I can actually can read it from the book because that would be wonderful. All right, here we go. Life is worth living. He says, when are we most happy? When are we most happy? When we do that for which we are made. As the microphone is happy when it does that for which it is made. Then there is a thrill and a romance to life. It may be objected that there are people who are full of life who hate repetition. Therefore, working toward the ideal goal is boring. No, look at those who are full of life. They love repetition. Put a child on your knees and bounce it up and down two or three times and the child will say, do it again. If you tell a child a funny story, the child will say a thousand times, tell me again. The child never says that's an old story. He says, tell me again. When divine life came to this earth, he re-echoed the lesson of the thrill of monotony. St. Peter was asked, how many times should we forgive? Peter thought seven times was enough. Our Lord said 70 times seven. There were three sweet monotonies in our Lord's life. 30 years obeying, three years teaching, three hours redeeming. He passed on to us this thrill of being born again, which was made a condition for entering into the kingdom of heaven. Because God is full of life, I imagine each morning Almighty God says to the sun, do it again. Every evening to the moon and the stars, do it again. And every springtime to the daisies, do it again. Every time a child is born into the world, asking for a curtain call that the heart of the God, heart of the God might once more ring out in the heart of the babe. Life is full of romance and thrill when it has one overall purpose, <clears throat> namely to be one with a life that is personal enough to be a father, to be one with a truth that is personal enough to be the wisdom from whence come all art and science and one that is personal enough to be a love that is passionless passion, a wild tranquility. Life is worth living when you live each day to become closer to God. When you've said your prayers and offered your actions in union with God, continue to enjoy the thrill of monotony and do it again. If I could add to close, to read it again, to question again, and to wonder again. Thank you.